All right, well, um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Barry Spriggs, um, Battalion Chief here with the Arcadia Car Department. Originally, Fire Chief Travey was going to be the speaker today, and he is recovering from back surgery. So he asked me to come and give the talk, and I have his notes. I'm going to make sure I, I crossed out his name and put my name in there so I won't read it verbatim and uh, call myself totally. Okay? Um, what we're going to do this, this afternoon is I have a little brief talk about the history of the Arcadia Car Department. And we'll go through that. And if you have any questions at the end of that, you can ask them. And also, I'd like to talk a little bit about disaster preparedness towards the end of the talk today. So we have a, a, pro, a plan we're doing right now in the city of Arcadia to update. Are, uh, how we address hazards in the community. So I just want to throw that out there as a little notice and also to get input back from you guys attending here today. Um, to start off, the uh, fire department here in Arcadia officially was organized in 1923, 20 years after the city became incorporated. Up until that point, the firefighting equipment in town was a roll, was a, a real uh, two and a half inch diameter fire hose kept at Old City Hall and if there was an emergency, Citizens would come from here and there and take that hose to the emergency and do the best that they could. Um, I'm sure it was great. Um, in 1923, Fire Chief Topping was appointed Fire Chief, and at that time he was both the Fire Chief and the Police Chief, and he, he shared duties for both. And there was, and that time the city also purchased their first fire engine, a 750 gallons per minute Seagraves pumper. And they had one paid firefighter at that time, a gentleman by, by the name of J.M. Nellis. And the remaining force consisted of volunteers, about 30 volunteers in the community who would drop what they're doing and come to help out if there was a fire in the community. Um, like I said, at first this was kept at the old city hall right there at First and Wheeler. Um, about two years later, in 1925, a gentleman by the name of A.N. Culverly became fire chief. Two other paid positions were created for firefighters, and the fire station moved into its new quarters at 50 Wheeler at that time. Um, for my notes here and stuff, we gathered from here and there about 10 years later, the police and fire department became separated. There was no longer one person in charge of both. And at that time, J.M. Nellis, who was the first firefighter that was hired, he was promoted to fire chief and they added additional people as well to the paid roster. And they still, throughout this time, they still had volunteers in the community, but they were slowly getting a couple more paid positions to help take care of all the duties uh, in town. The next year, in 1936, uh, John Eshelman became fire chief, and more personnel were added. So in about you know, 13 years after first starting up, there were five paid people on the fire department here in town along with the, the core of volunteers that were helping out. Um, the year after that, the need for a second station was, was determined. Up to now, they're all over on 50 East Wheeler, and they built a second station at 14, in the 1400 block of South Baldwin Avenue. And at that time, they purchased, the city purchased two new fire engines for, that could pump 500 gallons of water apiece, and they added more personnel so they had folks at both of the stations. Um, and then in 1938, uh, J.M. Nellis was appointed back as fire chief again. I don't know what took place where he went down and came back up. Um, you, you can imagine what could have taken place, and we can uh, vote on it later. That would be um, at that time, 19 full-time firefighters were added to the to the department, and it, it ended. And at that point, the volunteer firefighter program here ended as a as the fire protection for there was enough paid personnel at that time that they went that route <coughs> um, the next thing of, of note down in here about 12 years later in 1950 our third fire station was added and that's in the current location today up there at 79 west orange grove and another pumper was purchased so they had a fire engine put inside the building and the addition staff initial staffing was increased as well so they would staff that so as you know over the first 20 25 years or so adding buildings, adding equipment, adding people to staff that, so that's how we started growing. Um, 
Also, in, uh, two years later, in 1952, one person was added as a full-time fire inspector, which later became the fire marshal position. Up to that time, the city of Arcadia here was mainly residential, and so that person was hired to handle residential inspections, and he would also take care of any um, checking out the houses, looking for any weed abatement problems or other problems on properties to alleviate the fire hazards from that. Yeah, at first, the big concern was dealing with residential stuff, but over time, as the city grew, as more mercantile businesses came in, as some industry came in, um, the fire prevention bureau was, bureau was increased, so they had a, more inspectors with more training to be able to inspect both the, the commercial buildings, the assembly buildings, the schools, to have a, a paid and, and uh, trained person to do that correctly because the hazard was growing in town and you needed more of the technical knowledge on how to do it. How am I doing so far? Good. I think I owe them dessert later or something to get the crowd excited. Something like that. Um, may, may I interject, Chief? Not yet. No. Oh, okay. no, thank you, Bill. But you guys can hear fine. There's no problem. <laughs> Talk through this and all. Okay. How long have you been with Arcadia? I've, I'm getting to that. That's, that's oh, an important thing now. We'll just we'll just say 16 or so years. And I have a career in public speaking spanning about 11 minutes. <laughs> okay. In uh, 1958, a new fire headquarters was built at the current location at 710 South Santa Anita. As things grew and expanded, we outgrew our home on Wheeler, so we moved down the street to the Santa Anita address. And at that time when they built that, if they built it, every time you build a fire station, you want to predict for the future. So that was built with the idea of you can have 16 on-duty suppression folks in there comfortably. Administrative offices were added. A state-of-the-art dispatch center was added, which maybe, maybe Bill back there was here when Oh, oh yeah, put into place. Um, also, at that time, in the same year, they, they, the station that was on Baldwin moved up here to the corner of Huntington Drive in Baldwin on property that was donated by the Los Angeles Turf Club. So, big year for station uh, addition, big year for station uh, remodeling. Just as the needs of the community grew, the needs to provide fire protection for it grew as well. Um, in 1958, after 35 years of service, Chief J.M. Nellis retired, and Lawrence Way was appointed as fire chief. In, in that year, we talked about the stations that got added, um, talking a little bit about the dispatch center, the state-of-the-art dispatch center they had there at that time. Um, what goes on for the talking in there, Arcadia placed a new telephone alarm system in the service. It was only the second one of its type here in the state of California, and was designed by Bell Laboratories. There were alarm boxes up to about 76 located on strategic corners in town and in front of um, assembly buildings or, in, or buildings that you would want to have a connection to the fire department right in front of. Providing and it provided instant telephone communications with the dispatch office. In that dispatch office, the state of the art one, there was a switchboard there where the call would come in and it was. You unplug the one wire, you plug it into the second spot, and transfer the calls that way. And I remember starting here as a firefighter, hearing the guys that, at that time, had been here a while, telling the stories of the switchboard, or telling stories about that, and just thinking back to, I know I've seen that in, in movies, or seen that in shows. <laughs> that, that, that was state of the art, and it, it worked for them, so that's why they had it there. Um, and also, at this time, the alarms were dispatched by one-way voice communication system. That person in the dispatch office would push a button and would talk over a loudspeaker to the station to tell them who was going on a call, where they were going, what they were going to go, and handle when they got there. So I'm assuming up to that point it was a phone call to the station or maybe a bell system. This was the first time they had a voice dispatch that was new to the station. I, I think a few years ago when they tore down on the headquarters, probably the original wiring that was from that system was still being used up till 2003. Um, a few more years go by, and in 1963, you know, we, the, the department has expanded, but the department has grown, and the need to get a, uh, a fire aerial ladder truck, so to speak, was determined. 
Uh, the first truck company, which carries specialized tools, specialized equipment, had an 85 foot tall boom. They call it a snorkel truck or an elevated platform. It's similar to like a, a, you see for a tree trimming truck where they have the basket up there that rotates around. And it could take a person 85 feet off the ground. It could spray down a thousand gallons per minute of water from there. And plus it carries more specialized tools. In our training room over on Baldwin, we have a photo of it and the equipment. And one of the things they had in there was the life net. You, which is a handful of firefighters stand around and hold this net and they look up and they say jump. <laughs> we, we don't use that anymore. It's been long gone since well before I arrived here. But it's one of the tools and they have it proudly displayed next to the truck when I believe when it was first put together and dedicated to putting service for the community. Um, in 1972, Chief Way retired and a Chief Gene Mahoney was hired in this place. Um, 1973 was a big year for me, an exciting year for me with my current role in the fire department. Um, the first rescue ambulance was placed in the service in that year. <laughs> at, at that time, the paramedic program, which we all take for granted today, was just beginning in Los Angeles County. And during 1973, nine firefighters from Arcadia went to school, became certified as paramedics, came back, and November 1st, 1973, the first paramedic ambulance was put into service for the city. Uh, one of my jobs is in, I'm kind of in charge of EMS for the department, so that's why I'm proud to, to name that moment because EMS is my life, and without that paramedic program, I have, I'd have less work to do, <laughs> which I wouldn't want. Um, also, in 1973, I mentioned Chief Mahoney was hired and appointed fire chief. Um, at that time, there was a little bit of a, the department was reorganized at that moment. Up until now, you had, um, there was an assistant fire chief, a fire marshal, and then you had the captains and the engineers and the fire trucks on the, on the crews. Um, what they did in 1973 was they, they added a chief position and, and provided a battalion chief on each shift, so there was a chief on duty 24 hours a day. Up until that point, the, the assistant chief and the fire chief and the fire marshal worked eight to five, and in the evening, the chiefs went home. So it was the captain supervising the crews. If there was something big at night, I'm, I'm believing they'd call the chief up at home and say, hey, get back in here. So as of 73 4, they have a chief assigned 24 hours a day, rotating on the ship along with the rest of the crews. Um, with that, they also created an, an administrative captain position putting a person in, and that person was in charge of the fire prevention bureau. So the fire marshal went on the floor, but they still had a, a person assigned to fire prevention to help make sure everything was working out and getting done. Right. Also in that year, they, we added some inspectors because the city's growing, there's more buildings in the city, so we added some part-time fire inspectors to handle the load. And also we added three shift public education officers. And you, one per shift, they would go out to the community to teach school kids about fire safety, give talks, and the big thing is getting the message out about fire safety and making the community more safe. Um, in 1975, we had a new fire chief. Chief, chief Robert Dick was appointed as fire chief. And a, a big, as 1975 also brought a tragic moment for the Arcadian Fire Department. Our, um, on in August 22nd, 1975, Captain Jerry D. Broadwell died in the line of duty. Um, he was on a, fighting a fire in a building on Santa Anita just below the railroad tracks. And during that fire, he fell through the roof into the fire. Um, the crews removed him, or pulled him out from there, and he passed away in a hospital a few days later. Um, Chief, uh, Captain Jerry Lee Broadwell was a big person in the community. Um, he enjoyed reaching out to kids a lot, and from that, the Arcadia Public Library named their child, their uh, child reading room, Jerry Broadwell Memorial Reading Room in there, and the plaque stands in there today. Also something uh, involving Captain Broadwell was um, our, our, the Arcadia Firefighters Association, on an annual basis right now, does a scholarship at Arcadia High School in name of Jerry Broadwell. So the Jerry Broadwell Memorial Scholarship is done annually for a student at our, as a graduating senior from Arcadia High. So it's a way to keep his memory alive in the community 
until we remember the sacrifice that he did for us. Um, 1977, Administrative Captain Jerry Gardner, who started in the city of Arcadia working for working in the Lou Bay down at Public Works, went to Fire Department, moved up the rank to Administrative Captain. In 1977, he became Fire Chief of the Arcadia Fire Department. Uh, he served as a chief for 19 years, and during his tenure, he upgraded dispatch from the old plug-and-play thing we were talking about earlier. <laughs> We added um, a two-story building on the end of headquarters on Santa Anita. The upstairs was a state-of-the-art dispatch center that dispatched for both for the fire department and for Arcadia Police Department. And the downstairs of the building was used as a training room and an emergency operations center for the city. Um, also, as while well, Chief Gardner was with us, we remodeled Station 2 on Baldwin to what it looks like today. Um, he added equipment, he added personnel, he increased training, and because of the work he did as fire chief to increase our level to, per, to uh, provide fire safety to the community, our department was rated class one by the Insurance Services Organization in 1991. Um, class one, it, it rates how we provide service, how we train the water the city has, the communication that we have, and it's a, it, it helps for commercial buildings to get a lower rate when they're being insured for that. So the one obviously is the highest, others, and that's what <coughs> the way to rate your department and to, to get a benchmark for how well they do, that uh, survey was done and it was completed and came out with a class one rate. Um, okay. Following Chief Gardner's retirement in 1996, the Arcadia Fire Department had a series of fire chiefs um, the gentlemen that served as chief for the next few years were Wayne Crabb, James Reed, Ken Lavoy, George Trapelli, and Pete Bonanno. Each gentleman came through for about a year or two, and they served as either acting chiefs or interim chiefs or fire chiefs for us over the next uh, six or seven years. In 2002, David Lugo Jr. was appointed fire chief. He came to us from the city of Redlands. Um, during his tenure, um, our headquarters station was remodeled, was torn down to the ground and rebuilt. Our station up on, on Orange Grove was remodeled right around the time he was here, or right before he came. And um, he also did this, uh, reorganized the department and added a deputy chief position as well. So now um, there was the fire chief, a deputy chief spot who helped the fire chief with administrative duties, and then the same organization which I'll off what that is. I'll, I'll talk about that right now. Um, how we're set up right now, and since Chief Lugo was here until now, the, the department is organized in a similar fashion. We have our fire chief and our deputy chief, and they're, con and they're considered <coughs> administration. Also, as part of administration, we have a management analyst that helps with the budget and other issues, and we have, and we have an administrative specialist that, that really helps us with everything. She makes sure that we keep on track and we Make the appointments we're supposed to make and make sure all our I's and dotted and our T's are crossed. That's the admin portion of it. Chief Trivi tries to call the department as three spokes to a wheel. We have our um, administrative portion, which I just talked about. We have our fire prevention portion with a fire marshal, a fire inspector, and two part time positions that help out with fire prevention as well. Uh, and the third part is our fire suppression. Um, the people you see behind you there. Um, they consist each shift. There's, we have three shifts that rotate on a 24-hour basis, and on each shift there is a battalion chief. Um, there are there's a truck company with three personnel, including a captain. Three engine companies with three personnel, including a captain, and two paramedic rescue units with each having two paramedics on it for a total of 17 personnel a day. And so we rotate, and that's spread amongst the three stations, so, and like frequently each distance, so it rotates a lot. Um, in addition to that, we have volunteers in the city that work for the fire department. We have, we, uh, they're called reserve firefighters, people that have graduated the fire academy, and they um, come with us, they work one shift a week for free, with a little stipend to cover their lunch costs and uniforms, and they're there to gain training to either be hired by us or to be hired by another department. It's like a... Uh, intern. Thank you. An intern. <laughs> 
Um, also, we have civilian volunteers that help out in the front office. We have people that are photographers for us. They all, uh, a person that helps out with EMS billing and doing the paperwork for that. And we have other folks that help out in fire prevention for filing and other stuff. So we're, we're trying to get some more volunteers to help out. Just finding a, not only getting volunteers, but finding a niche for them that they'll thrive in and feel like they're um, able to contribute. Um, in, uh, like I said, this I'm going by the notes that Chief Tremie gave me, so I made sure I read them ahead of time. Because it, it began here with, I became fire chief, which is not me, so I had to change it to make sure it's the right person. Uh, Tony Tremie became our fire chief in 2007. Um, he rose up through the ranks. He started here as a crewman, then a fireman, then as a firefighter paramedic, as a captain. So he's been with us his whole his whole career in the fire service. And uh, that's that's a brief. A snapshot of the history of Arcadia Fire. And I was talking prior to beginning the day about it. Um, to develop this talk better would be to take this information and also to weave into it some fires that, that occurred over time that residents might be aware of. And I'll remember the First Avenue fire that took place at the school, or this brush fire at this time, and try to get more of a, a rounded presentation. Um, any questions on the history of Arcadia Fire Department? Or things that I said that you, you may know, well, I, I, I'm not quite sure about that. Because you might have a little more knowledge of history around here than I have, so. Um, so what do you do instead of safety nets now? Um, <laughs> good, good question. <laughs> we, still have, we still have a ladder truck. We don't, we don't have the snorkel anymore. We have a hook and ladder with a 100 foot ladder. And the goal behind that is to set it up in such a way that you can raise the ladder to the window, send a firefighter up the ladder, to help the person off the window onto the ladder and take that person back down. I, I, ideally, it would be best to go inside with your hose line, keep the fire from spreading, and take them down the hallway down the stairs. That's the Sorry. safest way to do it. Um, the, the, taking the aerial ladders is the next, next best way, and then also, depending on how high up they are, you're throwing a, a, what we call a ground ladder or a um, extra strong extension ladder up against the building to go up there and take it down. <coughs> no, one, no more life than that. <laughs> <laughs> when the 612 Medica building was built for eight stories, and I still believe it's the largest tallest building in town. Were there special provisions made so we can get better fire? Um, all well, fire defense experts, where'd you go? Well, the, the tallest building is 150 North San Diego. That is truly our only uh, by code, uh, high rise. 612, Mrs. Beats, high rise by about three feet. <laughs> <laughs> there are, most buildings at that height, there are provisions in there. That's why it was retrofitted with sprinklers, I believe, after it was built. And there's other requirements in there for stand, uh, stand pipes and stairwells that get water up to the floors, um, dedicated stairwells that get people down that aren't, that don't connect to the rest of the building so they can go down in a safer environment from there. I know for drills, for new engineer candidates, we do practice laddering that building at night and everyone's gone from there because the ladder builds that building during the daytime hours during the week and cause a little bit of a problem. So we do drill on that and the ladder up. But the big thing for anything that tall is to use what's built in there with the fire sprinklers and the stand pipes and the alarms and training there on the building to alleviate any problems that way. We didn't add we didn't add any equipment in the city because of that building that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Does it answer your question? Yes. I want to know if uh, you get priority on use of water in the community. Would they shut down uh, water to everything else in the community if the fire department needed it? And uh, do they give you any special rates on your water use? <laughs> okay. Um, see, the city of Arcadia, I know, is doing a, a drought policy or a water policy to address the current need because despite we got a lot of rain, but there's other issues we'll hear about to do. What I can answer you on water for the fire department is if there is a big fire and the incident commander realizes that the pressure is not adequate, high enough or adequate enough, because our engineer is pumping the rig has a gauge showing the pressure of the water coming into the pumper. So that person is going to get an idea. Hey, I started with 100 pounds, now it's down to 10 pounds. Hey, Chief, we need, this is going on. Okay. 
So then the water department for the city has standby crews. And what they've talked about is if, if we need them, we can give them a call and they can, they can do, I don't know what they do, but they can do something to get us more pressure or more water. I, I can take a guess, but then, then I'll be quoted and you'll go to the water guy and say, say Barry said this. But that's what, in the event of a fire, they do that. I also know on red flag days, which was Santa Ana wind kind of days, the city makes sure that all the reservoirs are topped off. So we get our water, our water in town is pumped to the reservoirs and gravity pressure back down to the houses. So they make sure those things are full so the event of a fire across the interface, we have as much water as possible available to fight that fire. Uh, special rates for flowing water, I, there, as far as I know, there are no rates that we are charged for flowing water for train. We try to do it, we have a test pit where we can recycle the water. We try to make sure we're not putting a bunch of water out and on the streets. So we have things set up where we can go that will um, remove water from a, from a, a, a static basin or I used to know that stuff before I made it. <laughs> uh, remove it from the pumper and pump it back into it so we're not pouring water down the street. Does that answer your question? Oh, doing good. Too, too. Uh, any other questions from? Yeah, yes, many years ago during the month of December, there was a bad arboretum fire. We observed many trees on fire. And I wonder if there have been any other fires like the arboretum since that time. Um, well, like there, there's, there's been smaller versions of it. What we do in training, when we're training a new captain or new engineer, we'll, we'll go out and we'll put that, that, that idea in the person's head. Okay, it's windy. You know, Hugo Reed, we have the area, area just south of the Arboretum, we have a fire in the Arboretum, it's, it's going to spread this way, what would you do? And they kind of go through that thought process, okay, I'll go to send people into the Arboretum to help put it out, I'll send crews over to make sure the citizens and the community is okay, and we've talked about that in training, and fortunately, because we haven't had much, we've had smaller things take place in there, but nothing on a grand or a large scale. I think a lot of it is the, they've been good at cleaning underneath the wires on the, the south side of the property there. So if something would happen, there's, there's nothing below it to really catch on fire. Let me just ask you, what is the significance of your three buttons? Um, depending on the unit, each button is worth is worth five years in the fire service oh, or more. On our, for, depending on the dress uniform, some have stripes. Um, for the captains and above, we have our little buttons there. So as soon as you're... 15, and you got to wait till you actually reach 20 to get your next one. You don't, they don't give you half a button or that <laughs> 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 um, Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have heard that uh, Arcadia has problems hiring firefighters because of the uh, expense of living in the area. Have, uh, have you really experienced any difficulty with finding firefighters? No, we do not. We, uh, every time there's a test, there's a large number of folks taking the exams. And with that, we have a lot of candidates wanting to come work for Acadia and work, and work in the fire service in general. So I would say that would be it. But you have to live in Acadia. No, you do not. You do not. There is no residence requirement to be a firefighter here in town. Um, in the MOU between the, the city and the firefighters association, you have to be able to respond back to the community in a certain amount of time, but there's no requirement to be physically in the town. Yes? Approximately how many calls do you get monthly for the paramedics? Let's see. Well, so I'll do some math real quick. We get about 4,000 or 4,400 calls a year. 70% of those are EMS related calls. So someone has a calculator. 2,800 a year. And <laughs> I gotta take my boots off and just throw them But it is about seventy percent of the calls, so we'll say I think it works out like does that answer your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also those people subscribe to the uh, fee that you pay. We have um, what what she's talking about is we have the city has a paramedic subscription program, which all residents and business owners are allowed to be part of. Um, I've not all the calls we go on are members of the program. 
So what we, what we do a lot with our program is we concentrate on talking to it at um, different, different places in the town that might be using the system a lot. We go to, um, I believe we talk on occasion at the senior citizens when, when you guys get together or when they get together over here and other buildings in town before. We push it out that way. But I think we only have maybe 25% enrollment at the most in that program. It's a good program, but it definitely saves you money in case you have to call on the paramedics. So. They bill you underwater. Yes. yes. It's 42 bucks for a single person and you can build their annual underwater. Except you can ask if you have a water jet. Right. But you can add if you're like somebody else that might be visiting you and do uh, that. If, if, if you have a person that's with you for a certain fixed amount of time, then that can be added to that. Yes, sir. You can have, a business owner can have that for his his or her employees as part of the, the member. I will get some contact information and get back to you, but I don't know for certain. Yes, sir. What's been in the Highlands is up here for over 40 years, and that hill has burned up. I think four times, if my memory is right, in the 40-some years we've been up there. Mm -hmm. And we, you guys have done a wonderful job. We have not lost a home due to the forest burning up there in over 40 years. <coughs> so you guys are number one on my list. <laughs> yeah, my too. Thank you very much, sir. It's, it's not only this department is a big combined effort of other guys coming to help, so thank you for your time. Okay, with, uh, let's see how we're doing here. I'm just gonna talk really quickly. So we've talked about history, we've done some questions and, and answers. I'm gonna talk really briefly about um, some disaster preparedness stuff we have going on in the city of Arcadia. Um, right now, um, we are updating what is called our local hazard mitigation plan. Every five years, a federal, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, wants, it, wants all cities to look at their town, look at the hazards that are there, and make sure you've identified any problems that can come from those hazards. And so we're going through the process right now of looking at that plan, seeing the hazards that we have located, okay, we, we feel these hazards will truly impact the town, and then we're gonna, also, we're gonna establish goals to make sure that we can handle those hazards. Um, right now, the hazards we feel that affect our town are wildfires, earthquakes, um, wind storms, flooding, and debris and mud flow and landslide kind of events. Those are the ones we identified five years ago as things that could impact us, and those are the ones that we're looking at still being a hazard and impacting us impact in the future. If we have time when you're done today, we'll talk some more about disaster prep. We brought some surveys. We have uh, pamphlets on disaster preparedness. For any of you that want to take that, it tells you how to be prepared for various things that could come across your way, both uh, earthquakes and fires. There's also stuff in here on how to keep yourself safe from crime. These are all available to you. Um, what we'd like to do, if you're interested, we have surveys to be completed because we're looking to see what the citizens of the community feel are a hazard so we get a better idea of how to steer that plan to make sure that we're addressing the needs that you feel as citizens are important to you. Um, with that plan, we use it as a, a tool to establish goals for the next five years on what should we as a city focus on for disaster preparedness. Should we focus on earthquake preparedness and making sure the citizens have kits available? Should we focus on wildfire um, awareness so we know how to do brush clearance and to prepare in the event of a wildland fire? The big thing system-wide or hazard-wide is always to be prepared, always to have a kit available in your car, in your house, so in case something does happen, you guys, um, you can be safe and you can survive for a period of up to 72 hours without help coming in your direction. So do you have water available? Do you have food available? Do you have medication available? Stuff like that, and the, the needs to have in your home survival kit are listed in that action brochure that, like I said, is available up in here. Um, any questions about 
well, we're talking about the plan or the surveys or anything like that? Yes, sir. Kind of a related one. Uh, a lot of communities are sponsoring the CERT program. And I, I don't know if we are or not, or what, what activity there is on that community emergency response. Right. Uh, um, um, right now, as a community, we don't have a CERT program. I know other cities around us do have a community emergency response team. They, they, name us, they put different names on them based on the city. Um, we have talked about that. Currently, right now, there's not enough staffing in the fire department to run that program. But that takes a it takes a dedicated individual, a, a person that can dedicate their time to that program. So the people that are volunteering have a sense of it's important to both the city and the community. Right? I guess in a long answer, no, we don't. But we've talked about it as a staff, and we, we, it's one of those things that's it'd be good to have, but there's no staffing or personnel available to make it happen. Any other questions? You have mutual aid uh, for situations like the forest fires and so forth. I know that uh, they set up a command post right in front of my house. One of the big fires up there, and they had more trucks from I think 20, 30 miles radius for a bone in there. Yeah, the, the big thing with with the fire service. The big thing is we, we realize we can't do it with by ourselves. Even, even with the even with the staff we have on duty today, it requires assistance from other cities to fill out the units that are sent to a first alarm house fire. Because we send enough units for the worst case situation, and then if we don't need them, we say cancel. You can return. Um, we use mutual aid every day for a house fire. We use it on that's a smaller scale for a. a, a Commercial buildings a little larger scale, and for a brush fire, it's an even larger scale than that. But everyone, the community in California is pretty good about. It. We all talk the same language, we all follow the same guidebooks. So if someone from Northern California shows up here, we're all playing on the same page. So mutual aid pretty much can blend pretty good. With it doesn't matter what the name you have on the door of the rig, everyone can get along reasonably well with each other. Do crews from Arcadia go often to other large fires in other states? Um, we don't go out. We've only been outside the state once since I've been with Arcadia. We do a lot of stuff up and down the state. And the, we provide, they, they call them strike teams, where if Santa Barbara has a large fire, they want to help. Through the state, it's organized that they'll, one inch from Arcadia will team up with Monrovia, Monterey Park, and other cities to put five inches together with the chief officer and go as a strike team to fight a fire in another county in another part of the state. We also have a state um, OES engine here in town, which the state of California purchased. They gave to us, and they say, if we need it, staff it and send it. So it's, it's a reserve engine for us, and it's during the fires, during the summers, or in the fall, if they call for it, then we staff it with our personnel and send it up there to fight the fire, and then it comes back. Going to, going to the large fire, it's good for we get to go help out, it also gives our personnel a lot of experience that we can bring back here in case something would happen here. Our personnel have been exposed to something of that site before, so we're not seeing an event for the first time when we're fighting in our backyard. Any other questions? Did that answer your question? But I, did you say, and I didn't hear you, how long you've been with the city? Uh, 16 years. 16. Do you work on this, the Baldwin? <clears throat> Um, I work out of the station on San Anita. I've been a chief a little over a year and moved up from firefighter to engineer to captain and been a time chief for about a year. If there are no further questions, if you have a moment before you leave, there we have my, my assistant here, able assistant Jeff will hand out some surveys. If you want to complete those, that would be very grateful that you guys did. And thank you for your time and your listening today. And Come back next month. We want to thank you.
Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, did you get any? Up the branch? Yeah. Uh, Slides and things out of range. Okay, uh, we're talking about maybe going up there over spring break, you know, with the kids, you know, like that. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, that would be 